Hello everyone, welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo David, and alongside I have John Manfreda. And today's podcast, we're going to answer some of the frequently asked questions that we get from our listeners and our, and our fans as well. Um, so John, uh, thank you for coming on. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and thank you for coming on as well. So. Uh, no problem. So uh, let's start off by answering one of the most frequently asked question and we're going to start with the gold and silver market and some of the questions I've gotten recently um, is have been coming since after the big drop in gold and silver when I, I well uh, excuse me when as you know uh, silver went below $20 um, even went below $19 at one point and gold went under uh, 1200 and now it looks like it's destabilized for now. And a lot of people are asking, could it go lower? And how long will it stay uh, this low? Are we, can we expect them to go back up sometime this year? So, uh, John, why don't you start off asking that question, and I'll follow up with my answer. Well, I would say one is I do think it's uh, somewhat manipulation has a part in it, but I would also say it's uh, Fed speak. You know, the nothing has changed fundamentally, but what has changed is Wall Street perception. The Fed's been talking about tapering uh, since February, and that's when the first real, I guess, mini crash began. And then April had a big one, and in June they they announced that we're going to taper if economic data warrants it, and so that created a lot of uh, automatic sell orders. There was Resistance at 22 and 20 on the charts. I don't really look at the charts that often, but on my own time, I didn't. But now that I'm a bullion dealer during the day, I, I'm required to. So, But there was at 22 and at 20. And once uh, it breaks one of those points, there's a lot of automatic sell orders. So that is what uh, has driven down the price artificially low. So I would say it's speculation, it's a little bit of manipulation, but once it hits some of these uh, charts, breaks some of these uh, resistance points, there's a lot of automatic sell orders. So uh, institutional selling, a lot of them uh, don't want to sound too much like conspiracy theorists, but uh, there's a lot of rating GLD and then selling it to Asia Asia for a premium. It's a quick way to make a buck. So that's just... Uh, what I've been seeing, uh, perception, and it's a combination of those three. And that's a good point. And also, um, the CME also raised margin requirements. A lot of the traders are forced to look to date uh, their position, and that also causes the gold and silver market to crash as well. Uh, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, good point. I completely forgot about that. They did raise margin rates. Uh, yeah, and and the big bank also uh, covered a lot of their shorts. And if you look at the COT uh, for silver, the commercial uh, short position is the smallest it, it had been since February 1993. And for the gold market, the uh, small net short position is at its lowest as it was in August 2002. So both uh, these uh, information indicate uh, that we're at a bottom here. And also, if you look at the market sentiment toward gold and silver, a lot of people are hating this market as well. If you look at what's going on in, in CNBC and other mainstream press, a lot of them are very bullish on gold. They think uh, gold and silver was in a bubble, and there's no justification for uh, for this market to go up that quickly, that fast, even though there is. So, uh, to me, uh, I think we are at a bottom. But uh, don't take my word for it because we've been saying that this market has been at a bottom for quite a while and we've been wrong. And so there's always the possibility that it could go lower. But keep in mind that a lot of the miners are not starting to shut down their production or slow production or delay exploration or expansion of the uh, of their mines. Um, and we've seen that a lot, a lot in the couple last couple of weeks. Uh, some of our favorite silver and gold stock are starting to uh, slow down production. Yeah, I won't. We won't mention the name of these stocks, but um, that's another bullish sign for us because that means the supply is going to be reduced and the demand is increasing. So that 
the uh, market's going to have no choice but to go up. So the price of gold and silver cannot stay uh, at this level for too long. Yeah. It's going to have to go up eventually. I definitely agree. And another contrarian indicator is uh, CNBC pundits are now actually attacking Peter Schiff's track record. I think that's a great contrarian indicator because he, two or three years ago, he was bragging about his track record and the pundits would not question it. So I think that's another contrarian indicator when CNBC uh, talking heads are attacking Peter Schiff's track record. Uh, they always attack him for whatever he says. Uh, that, that's nothing new. Yeah, that's true. But not his track record. Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Good point. But that's a good way to look at it. I, th I think they bash on anybody that like gold. Uh, I think uh, Jim Rickard had been questioned about his some of his calls as well. So yeah. it's not just Peter Schiff. It's a, any of these so-called gold investors or gold bugs that they've been bashing on as well. But uh, going back to the mining stock, if you look at the cash cost for a lot of these uh, major producers, if you look at uh, companies like uh, Silver Standard, which cash cost is at $27. So right now, they're not making any money, negative cash flow. So I, I don't want to be surprised to see them uh, cut back on their production or shut down their mine. And uh, there's only a handful of gold companies that have cash costs uh, below 1000 um, I'll name a few. Uh, one of them is Umana, uh, New Gold, and Gold Corp. And Colossus Mineral, which is a junior uh, mining company, they, when they start to go in production in the third quarter, their uh, cash cost is projected to be around $500 uh, per ounce, according to my sources. So, a lot of these, most of these uh, gold and silver mining companies are not going to make any money in the current environment unless the gold and silver price goes up. So to me, that's a bullish sign. And any gold and silver investor or potential investor, this is the time to take advantage of this. Yeah, I would also say a lot of the Yukon area, uh, which is very famous for mining, they've had to delay a lot of uh, production. They they planned on producing mid-2013. They're now pushing it back. So a lot of new mines are being suspended. Barrick laid off 30% of its employees in one day. So the miners are in really deep trouble, and a lot of them uh, have been cutting their dividends. If they, uh, So that's also the miners just – I don't think this can last too long. I don't think it will immediately shut down because the cost of having to restart it up. But if it goes on much longer, there will be bankruptcies. Yeah, and the Yukon uh, district is known for high uh – gray and silver so even those type of companies are having problem in this current environment so that tells you that uh, high grade does not mean uh, that they're safe when gold and silver prices go down um, so that's some, another thing that people to people need to look out for but overall it is a good time to buy but you got to be selective on what companies you got to buy you got to make sure that they're uh, production cost is at a reasonable level and that they're maintaining it or make an effort to reduce their production cost. Uh, they to make sure that the management has a good background uh, and good experience on, uh, uh, in, in the gold and silver mining sector, excuse me, um, and a lot of other factors as well that which we discuss in many of our other podcasts that people can check out as well. So people need to be careful and selective, but I think it's a great time to buy. And I, if people listen to the David Morgan podcast that you guys did the other day, uh, I believe he, he concur with this uh, statement. It's also a good time to buy some physical <laughs> below production it, cost. It will have to go up. So. Uh, yeah, you're right. They do have to go up. Uh, no, you work at a bullion dealer. Uh, could you uh, give us some insight on the demand uh, in the past uh, few days after the big drop? Has it been a lot of people buying or a lot of people selling? Well, there are some panic selling. Uh, some people bought at 9 and they're worried about their profits. Uh, so there is a little bit of that. Uh, there's What's going on, what I see the most is bottom fishing. Uh, some people are, and this is why we say dollar cost averaging, because they talk about buying at the top, but you can also be a victim of bottom fishing. And right now, a lot of people are just like, well, I don't think this is the bottom. Does it really matter? If you think this is a great value, buy a little bit, and then if it goes lower, you can buy more. But 
what could happen too, and this is why I think it's a great dollar cost averaging thing, is some people say, you know, when it was at nine, well, I think it go to seven, so I'm going to buy that. And then, well, they missed the bottom. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of bottom fishing. So some people are afraid to pull the trigger. Uh, and then there's, uh, I would say the smart money. Uh, one guy, some people are just, they're just like, yes, let's lock in this deal now. I'll send you a check. And some people are just, their uh, stuff they would normally just mail a check or they're literally overnighting stuff so they can buy just in case it drops. So I would say it's it used to be a big demand. People were buying in April and May. June, they froze up a little bit. And this is now the segment. It's really divided into threes. And that's what I've been seeing. Let's talk about the premium. I've, I've been checking out the premium for the silver uh Eagle coins, and I see some of them around three and five dollars. They're not as high as they used to be a couple months ago when we had that first big drop, but um, it's, it's a little bit higher than before. So, what are you saying on the premium side? Two things. Uh, well, one, obviously, demand is bigger, so uh, it's low spot price. Uh, but also, I think some of it's also just the logistic issue. Most mints are government made. They're run by government, so they're slow. They're not producing. They're not they don't have to meet the man, but what are they gonna do? Fire them? You know, they got all the government union protectionism. So they're Perth Mint, their premiums actually have remained constant and that's because they actually produce uh they're a big cash cow for the Perth of Australia. So their premiums have remained constant and it's also because they increase production. And the mints they're, they're business. Let's be honest. If you know this demand isn't going to last because prices will are going to eventually go higher and people are going to be selling on the secondary market, it's just not a good business decision to hire more workers, train them, and produce. And then you don't need them anymore. And not only that, the mints are government, so trying to fire them is going to be a hard task. So uh, I would say that's one of the reasons uh, premiums is just – uh, there is definitely a bigger demand for silver, but it's also a logistics issue in the mints. Okay, that's an interesting point. So let's uh, answer one of the other questions that we got from one of our uh, viewers. It's, which uh, gold and silver company to offer the most leverage? So in my opinion, I think the junior mining company to offer the most leverage uh, for num numerous reasons. Uh, one of them is... A lot of the junior mining companies, uh, they have no production, so their earnings is literally negative or zero, uh, no cash flow coming in. And so once they go into production and they hit their guidance, uh, they keep cash uh, production costs under control, their earnings start to go up and explode, and people on Wall Street start to notice, and they jump in. So that would, uh, so you see... Uh, junior mining company that will increase five or tenfold so that's why i think junior miners have offered the most leverage you don't you don't get that kind of leverage with a senior producer like newmont or gold corp yeah i definitely say i definitely agree juniors can off, offer a lot of leverage and not only that uh once the seniors start making money again on the upswing they'll start buying the juniors out for premium and uh, the seniors actually do the opposite of what you should be doing when investing. They buy high, like Barrick buying that copper line, and they don't buy when, you know, this is the time, except for, like, Keith Neumeyer, who's probably salivating. He made one acquisition. He lost uh, Orico to Cordae Lane, and he's probably trying to buy another one. New Gold, they're smart. They're buying now. This is when they should be buying but the senior producers, they'll buy the juniors at premiums when gold's back at 2000 or something. So that's, a, yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I think that's another reason juniors offer a great leverage. Uh, and if people want even more leverage, they can like to look at the warrant or the options as well. Um, if, they, uh, if their risk tolerance is high enough, they should look into that as well. But they got to play it smart. Uh, and you could lose your money overnight. So I, I, People out there need to be careful with that. But uh, that's the subject for another day. So let's move on to one of the other questions that we got regarding the gold and silver companies. Uh, one of the questions that we get a lot is, which country do you think are the safest to invest in? So uh, why don't you go first and uh, answer that question? I would say the two uh, top ones are, uh, I would say top two are Canada and Mexico. 
And uh, one of the reasons I like uh, Mexico is that mining is a big cash cow to them. So unlike a developed world that has perceived safety, Mexico has to make it work because their economy just needs it more, I would say. So, uh, but they also have a great, they're very mining friendly in their jurisdiction. They're not going to kill it. They, they know the saying, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I would say Canada is a very natural resource of intense economy, too, as well. They are socialists, but they're not like the American socialists. They're not stupid. They know if they kill off mining that uh, their economy will just go south really quick. So, And Brazil has great resources, and I think they're, gonna, they're also a safe one. So. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, but keep in mind... Uh, doesn't mean that uh, you should not look at companies that are, you know, politically unstable uh, countries. Uh, like one of our country, uh, I'm sorry, one of the oil stock that we like a lot is in a country that's politically unstable. But we like it a lot because we know this uh, government uh, is going to get a lot of tax revenue from this business. So they're going to let them uh, operate and do what they want. So doesn't mean that uh, companies in a politically unstable, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a company in a political unstable country does not mean you should ignore it and not look at it. Uh, now, granted, there are comp uh, countries that we do not invest in at all, like South Africa, because of the union problem, and that's a big problem that cannot be solved, unfortunately. So it, it can be solved, but it's going to be a lot of bloodshed, and it's going to take years and years and years to resolve. And... Um, Another country that uh, we like to avoid is the Middle East as well, uh, for obvious reasons. But there are other countries that uh, we think, uh, depending on the situation and the, the company's relationship with the government, uh, is worth investing. Um, like if you look at Silver Wheaton, they have a streaming deal with Barrick for the mine that's in uh, Argentina and Chile. I think you know what I'm talking about, John. Yes, Pascal Lama, yeah. Yeah, so just recently uh, the government approved their water management system, and so they have the full green light to uh, continue developing this mine, which is great news for in people that invest in Silver Wheaton. So, and the, in, the reason why the Argentinian government approved this mine because they know this mine will be a cash cow for them in terms of tax revenue. So they're not that stupid. Even though they are a socialist country, they're still going to let people do business in their own country. Yeah, and not only that, in order for socialism to proceed, they need money. And yeah. they understand that part. Yeah, they got to uh, pay for the campaign promises somehow. So they got to let somebody do business in their country. Otherwise, <laughs> there'll be a lot of people on the street protesting. So that's the question that we uh, answered. Uh, so let's move on to another topic. And this is a question that we get a lot from our viewers. It, the Federal Reserve has been making a lot of noise lately. Uh, ben Bernanke uh, just told everyone that uh, by next year that they're going to withdraw their QE program and stop buying um, treasuries. And in reaction to that, the stock market, gold and silver, all went down. And went down, uh, I think the Dow Jones went down 2 to 3% uh, on, one of the, on one of the days. And gold and silver obviously went down uh, a couple percent as well. And so, John, for one of the questions that we got is, do you think we'll see a stock market crash this year or a sharp correction only to be followed by more QE with the Fed expanding its balance sheet? I would say that's definitely possible. Like in June, uh, late June, uh, say the 18th or 19th, I forget the exact, I forget the exact date. But they talked about tapering. They said in late 2013 they're going to reduce. By mid 2014, as long as economic data warrants it, they are going to uh, do away with uh, easing altogether. And what happened was Treasury yields rose significantly to 2.61%. And the Dow dropped 300 points the next day, over 300 points. And so I think we could have a correction soon. 
and then they would announce more stimulus. I personally think the reason they decided to do a more hawkish statement is because, easy, they saw oil at $99. They knew if it was dovish, oil would break over 100 and who knows where it would go. And they, I just don't think anyone, they don't want to see $140 oil because of July of 2008, what happened. So uh, that's what I think happened. That's why, and testing the markets, but uh, I think it's very possible. I think if it even goes near 12,000, they're going to announce more stimulus immediately. Uh, I don't think it, I don't think it will correct much further. But I think this year they will increase stimulus, and I think it's a very likely scenario. Uh, we can't say for certain, especially in this market that's so uh, manipulated and backstopped, and we just don't know government policy. You know, it's a thinly traded market during the summer, so and the Fed's doing a great job of good cop, bad cop. So uh, if there's any sign of a correction, they might. I think they'll bring out a Fed president, and so. Uh, Stock more. I think it'll probably be a small correction. I don't see a big one happening just because the Fed board governors, uh, I'll say something nice about the Fed. They're doing a great job with this good cop, bad cop thing. And that's a good point. And I, in my opinion, I, I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to stop QE. And the logic behind my belief is, is rather simple. If you look at the government and how much they're spending, they're at a budget deficit right now. So if the Federal Reserve decided to stop QE, that means they're going to stop buying Treasury bonds. And who else is going to buy those? Because the Federal Reserve is buying 75% of those bonds. And China is uh, cutting down. Japan is cutting down. A lot of the other countries are cutting down. Um, unless uh, they raise the interest rate because they want more premium for taking the risk on lending money to uh to the U.S. So the interest rate will rise if they stop the QE and unload their balance sheet. So that will have an effect on the mortgage uh, rate. So that will collapse the housing market. Credit card rates will go up. Anything that related to uh, lending and borrowing, interest rate, all will go up. It will completely crash the economy. And the Federal Reserve are not stupid. They know that. So I just think Bernanke was trying to manage uh, the market a little bit when he came out and said that they're going to withdraw QE. I, I would not be surprised if after he left they roll out another QE program um, because there's no way they could stop this because they know the consequences are severe and the last thing they want is deflation, which is, uh, if you follow Austrian economic uh, a cure to the disease that we have in this economy. I think we do need inflation, but the Federal, the Federal Reserve doesn't think we need that. So therefore, um, I I believe they're going to continue the QE program. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think they will. It's not a question of uh, if it's when. So I think um, I actually wonder. I think I wonder if they're actually watching. I know they're watching gold and silver, but I wonder if they're watching oil prices and if they have an oil price target. Like if it hits eighty-eight, then we can announce a QE. So I was wondering what you think. Uh, I think they will roll out another QE after Bernanke leaves. So whoever takes over, which could be Yellen. Um, so after he leaves, I think they'll do it. So, um, so I definitely don't think they're going to stop Kiwi. Or Paul Krugman. <laughs> I know he was yeah. it. Oh, man, yeah. that would be a funny one. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to our next question. One of the questions that we got from our viewers is, will we see a hyperinflationary scenario like Walmart Germany after the market crashes? Uh, and it depends. Uh, it depends on how the market crashes. If the market crashes because of deflation, then no, we're not going to see hyperinflation. Um, because um, I'm not a history buff, but I believe uh, the market crashes after they had hyperinflation in Germany. Uh, John, uh, you can correct me on that if you know anything about that. Well, I did read When Money Dies, and I think it was at after the hyperinflation, it was, uh, I know just before the hyperinflation, Germany was, or Weimar was the envy of the world. People were wondering, they lost the war. How are they rec 
recovering. The stock market was going at all time highs. You know, everything was feeling great. Everyone felt like it was in a recovery. Of course, it was an illusion. So, so I do remember that. It's a great book if you want to see the just when money dies. If you want to see just the human element of hyperinflation in Weimar. It doesn't right, have too that, much uh, statistical and number crunching, and this happened, that, but it was just more the human element of it. That's correct. That, that book was written by Adam Ferguson when money dies, and he that book was written um, talking about why my Germany and what happened. So a bit, people definitely should check that book out. I haven't read it myself. I know, John, you've read it, but that's the book that's on my list to read. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Let's move on to our next question, and this is a question that uh, not we haven't gotten reached uh, often. And the question is: Jim Sinclair and some others are saying to buy gold and silver companies either direct registration or certified form to prevent seizures, sort of like what happened with MS Global. Uh, so, what are your recommendations? Well, I, I don't uh, do direct registration or get the certification of all any stock that I own, but it is a good way to protect yourself just in case your broker uh, collapse, sort of like what happened to MS Global. Um, if people want to know more about how to do that, they should go to uh, bullmarketthinking.com. Uh, the owner of that site wrote a great book on how to do this, uh, so people should definitely go to that site and check it out. Um, so if you want to do it, uh, I'd say go for it. It's a good way to protect yourself just in case something happened. I'd also keep an eye on your brokers financially, if they're financially stable. Um, because what you don't want to happen is you wake up one day and your broker called you and said, well, your money's not there anymore, so you cannot withdraw. So and that happened to uh, Gerald Salente, I believe, because he had an MS Global account, right? Yep. Gerald Salente. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, he's funny, but I love the saying when Gerald loses. Gerald always says when people lose everything, they lose it. And at that point, it looked like it, when Gerald lost it, lost something, he lost it, man. Yeah. So uh, once again, if people want to learn about how to uh, 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 get ownership of a gold and silver company to direct registration, uh, go to bull thinking, bullmarketthinking.com, excuse me, and check out the ebook that's written by the owner. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the uh, one of the questions that we got is regarding hedging and option. Uh, John, do you want to uh, read this question out for us? Yeah, one of them was, uh, this one I think is very important for our listeners was, if I'm not approved for level two options to buy puts, what are some good hedging strategies? Well, the, uh, a good way to... Uh, go around it is you could buy um, a call on the inverse ETF. Uh, that's one of the ways to get around it. Uh, and for people that don't know what the option level 2 means, that means that uh, you can only uh, buy put or calls on ETF or stock. It won't let you uh, also do cover calls. It won't let you uh, go short. And most brokers have different standard and requirement that investors need to meet in order for them to go to level three. So, um, and all of it is re regarding experience and background. So, if they don't let you do it, a good way to do it is to, uh, using inverse ETF. Yeah, I definitely agree. And not only that, if you ha if you have a lot of uh, positions in miners or gold and silver, uh, you can hedge by having you know take you know five percent and put it in the dollar bullish index the pro shares and that is a that could be a hedge one other uh question we have right now is uh if i wanted to play the stock market or gold and silver uh what would you recommend for trading purposes uh depends depends on the risk tolerance um, oh, I meant I, symbols, like... Oh, I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, I meant, sorry, I didn't say it. If I wanted to place the stock market or gold and silver, uh, right. if I wanted to trade it, what symbols would you recommend? 
Uh, well, it depends. If you want an ETF, um, if they want to trade uh, using SOV, GOD, short term, I'm okay with that. I'm I'm not okay uh, buying and hold GOD and SOV, but I do trade around uh, using the ETF. If you want a, uh, an ultra, uh, uh, I'm sorry, an ETF where you can short silver, another one is ZSL, Zebra, Sam, and uh, Love, ZFL. That's another ETF you could look at if you want to um short silver um and also uh, people want if people have higher risk tolerance and are more advanced they could uh, look at futures uh we don't deal with that but uh, pe if people want to look into that they should uh i, sh I recommend that they uh, follow uh, david morgan uh, because he talked about uh trading so uh, futures in his videos a lot so people should definitely check that out all right, yeah, so I definitely say just want to disclose that options are, you know, they're very dangerous. They're very, uh, they're very, uh, you can lose a lot if you don't know what you're doing. So definitely try to learn a little bit about options before you, uh, before you engage in options. There are people that. Yeah, definitely. And another, uh, silver ETF, uh, that's out there, uh, the, the leverage is the age. G Q. Uh it's a Adam uh G as in um Gary and Q. So people should check out that uh ETF as well, um if they want to trade options. So those are the ETF I would look at if I uh, if I'm thinking about trading. Um so let's answer one final question that we got here. And I skipped this because the we talk about gold and silver a lot in this podcast, but I want to get back to it since we have a couple more minutes. And one of them is, where do you see gold and silver going this year, forecast-wise? Uh, which is very hard to do. We don't do forecast for gold and silver. Um, I think the beginning of this year, I thought silver would be around $45 and gold would be above 1800 But I don't think that's going to happen anymore. I think uh, if I had a guess, not, and don't hold hold me back on it, but I, I, if I had a guess, I think silver will be around twenty eight to thirty dollars by the end of this year, and gold will be uh, around thirteen hundred. Um, I don't think this is the year where gold and silver will explode and go up. Um, unfortunately, make all times high. Um, I thought it would be, but uh, because this market is so manipulated, you just never know what's going to happen. So it's hard to answer that question. Yeah, I thought in January the correction would was over, and then in late January I was like, oh, it looks like I called the bottom. I, I did for oil. Well, so far, who knows? It could go back down to 88. Uh, but in terms, I said I did say the commodities, so I was wrong, meaning gold, silver, uh, and I was wrong on that. And uh, I would say it's just I, I never would have guessed they would talk about tapering. I thought they would, if they did, it would have been at the end of the year. So. Uh, you just one other thing is in terms of making predictions three or four months from now, you just don't know what's going to come out of any of these politicians or uh, central bankers' mouth. So it's also hard to make a three-month or six-month prediction because, as you see with the board of governors, they're doing good cop, bad cop. So you just you just don't know. It's hard to predict the inner inner trend. It's the old saying is you can't manipulate the. Uh, long-term trend but you can inter manipulate the inner workings of it so and one other viewer question was is currently i uh i hear all i hear about is invest in gold and silver gold and silver is a great opportunity and w one of them was if i wanted to diversify uh is there any other sectors that you see uh, that are would be good investments or in a bull market or provide good diversification for my gold and silver positions. Yeah, there are definitely a lot of other markets that, that we think is a good investment. Another one, uh, another sector that we believe uh, is a good uh, buy is the energy sector. And I know uh, you, John, follow the MLP and the Energy Canadian Oil Trust Fund. Uh, you follow them a lot. So why don't you talk about that and why you think these are good uh, buy 
Well, I like, uh, in terms of the Canadian, right now they have a lot of infrastructure problems. Uh, Keystone or Northern Gateway Pipeline haven't been built yet or approved, so the oil sands are getting really tough. Suncor, I think, will definitely survive it. That's a low-cost producer. They're really good. They even hedged it with refinery because then they could refine it at Syncrude oil sands cost and then sell it on to the market as a refined product, so that's hedging uh, some of their production. So that's why they're able to increase their dividend despite these low prices and, you know, pay out, have a share buyback program. So, but the oil sands, they're a little tough right now. I think the pipelines will be built for the same reasons we went over before. Canada's socialist, but they're not stupid. They realize oil sands are going to pay for that socialized medicine and all the government benefits. Eventually, I think they'll approve the Northern Gateway Pipeline. I think Keystone will get approved, but... I think even if that's not approved, they'll definitely get it. And they're working on rail to get it on the market. So I think right now, and they're in the same boat as gold and silver. If these uh, oil sands prices persist, a lot of production is going to come offline. Therefore, they need higher prices. They must go up, and they will go up. So I would say, you know, I think 2014 might be a good buying year for the oil sands in Canada. Uh, and I like uranium. I think that's a great contrarian play. I think you have some time for that. Uh, there's so many countries investing in nuclear. China, Russia, India, Australia, and uh, Dubai made a free trade deal. Saudi Arabia is making 16 power plants. Megatons, megawatts is coming online. And there's always natural gas infrastructure. The infrastructure, about $2 trillion in the U.S. alone, will need to be invested to have a you know, good energy infrastructure. Emerging markets are building uh, natural gas. A lot of countries are using natural gas as a replacement of coal. So uh, the tankers and the shippers, are they're doing a great – they look like to be a great investment. The MLPs have really gone up. If you deal with the K1s, they're great. Their distributions are rising, and their cash flows are stable, predictable. So I and they pay great dividends. So if you can if you have a large portfolio, you can actually use those and buy physical bullion with them. So and that's a great point. They provide a good fixed income for income for um, investors as well. Those MLPs and those, a lot of the oil oil stocks. So people uh, get uh, exposure to the energy market and also get a good fixed income uh, compared to like the one or two percent yield that you get in a treasury bond. Yeah. I also think the consumer staples are a good way, you know, just in case there is another correction like this. Uh, Absolutely. Johnson & Johnson and all them, they'll, they're stable. They've increased their dividends for a while. And I think uh, if you just don't want all energy and commodities exposure, a Pfizer, stuff like that will just provide a, a good, uh, I guess, risk hedge. Yeah. Also, Caterpillar, John Deere, a lot of the... Uh, construction uh, equipment uh, providers. They also provide good yield. Coca-Cola, Walmart, Costco, I like Costco. Uh, they pro their earnings have been solid and they provide good yield as well. So people should definitely check that out for diversification as well. And that's all the time we have on this podcast. If people have any other questions they want to ask us, they could either send us to our website, www.wallstreetformainstreet.com. You can contact us there, or you can uh, submit your question on our YouTube channel or on our, or on our videos, any of our videos. Uh, we'll cash them there uh, on our Facebook fan page and Twitter fan page as well. And if you also, if you go to our website, you can also uh, subscribe and have a chance to win a free uh, American Silver Eagle coin as well. So definitely check that out as well. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, and if you like this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Yeah, definitely. So until next time, uh, everybody, good luck with this upcoming week in the stock market. And we'll talk to you again soon.